Hello again and welcome back to all the listeners and of course newcomers to the second ever episode of the Extended Panel Sports Show brought to you in association with Lear Media. I'm Ty Busher for your host and joining me as always I have renowned panelists, sports aficionados, Wayne Power, Gary O'Hare and Jimmy Maher. Good evening folks. Good evening Shooks. Good evening Shooks. Coming up in today's edition, our panellists outline their top five Ireland rugby players of our era. We're joined in the second part of the show by world silver medalist, Irish hockey player, Roisin Upton. And stay tuned in part three as the panellists address questions from the listeners who so kindly got in touch with the page. You are, of course, listening to the extended panel. Fellas, how are we doing? Short Not story, well, good. Bit of a restructure on our part. Uh, over the coming weeks, we'll be aiming to start off each episode by tying down a list of Ireland's greatest ever sports stars in each code. To kick us off this week, after many hours of deliberation and debate, we came up with our top five Irish rugby players uh, of our era. The viewers are privileged to our final decision, but poor Gary has lost sleep over this lad. He still isn't happy. Uh, I'll, hold, I'll hold off on that for a moment, but I'm going to pass it over to my trusted colleague, Wayne Power, to read out the final and official extended panel top five Irish rugby players. Thanks, Jokes. Good to be back for another episode, and this is the list that we came up with eventually. At number five, Keith Wood. At number four, Johnny Sexton. At number three, Paul O'Connell. At number two, Ronan O'Gara. And at number one, the infamous Brian O'Driscoll. There you have it, folks. That's our list. Take it or leave it. Uh, lads, I can't delay him any longer. Mr. Rugby himself, Gary O'Hare, you're, you're itching to get in there. You agree with the top five, am I right in saying, but not the order? I agree with, yes, I agree with the top five, Shucks. I think Sexton edges out O'Gara, for me anyway. I know there's a few... Uh, monster men here that will disagree but <laughs> well the list ends anyway Gary you, you might take us through our choice at number five and why we set, why we settled on Keith Wood there yeah well shucks I mean Keith Wood uh, obviously he kind of he burst on the scene when the Irish national team wasn't uh, didn't have the status it does have now and but I just think his ability alone he was so dynamic so fit uh, he's his try scoring record was phenomenal. I think he scored uh, 15 tries for Ireland, which was the most any hooker, any hooker has got in the world game. Mm. And I think if we look at certain performances, I kind of, my own, who was looking back to the first Lions test in 2001, I think his performance that day was unbelievable. He man of the match. Mm. And for me, he's a banker in the top five. Yeah, I think he, he made a couple of our lists when we were putting it together. He was, a, he was an obvious contender. I'm going to move it on to number four, uh, Jonathan Sexton, I suppose. He was another obvious candidate for the top five. Um, there was quite a bit of debate between him and O'Gara as to who was the better 10. We opted for O'Gara in the end. But Sexton, of course, you know, he still hasn't even finished playing at, at 34 years of age. An industrious 10. I think he had 112 caps he has racked up, or caps, test caps he has racked up for Ireland. He exploded onto the scene. Um, his debut was in 2009. He really pushed on there. Uh, you know, he could end up being Ireland's greatest ever 10, giving us some really, really magic, magic moments through the years. You know, like that, uh, that drop goal against France in the 2018 Six Nations. Everybody remembers that, the stuff of legends. Stuff, ma magic, magic memories. Um, a ver another versatile player, you know, he can, flat, uh, he can slap in at, at full back or, or centre, but obviously his preferred role is, is in the, in the centre. I don't think... I don't think, to, or at, at 10, I don't think too many players uh, or too many people can argue with us on, on that one Sexton at number four. He was always going to make the top five. Jimmy, uh, moving on then, from a coaching and manager's perspective, I know Paul O'Connell was a search for you on that list. Maybe highlight to the listeners why it is that we pencil Paul O'Connell in at our number three spot. Uh, look, Shooks, to be honest, uh, Paul O'Connell is just a wonderful player for Ireland, so he was, and a um, fantastic leader. Um, really the, the heartbeat of that Irish team. Um, you know, the type of player that you love to play for. Um, you know, carry huge respect around the dressing room. Um, super work ethic, uh, great humility about him, Shucks. And, and it was always about the team with O'Connell. 
um, the team and the bigger picture. You know, he left that Irish jersey in a, in, in, in a fantastic place when he retired. 100%. Some, some amazing uh, memories, I suppose, even of him giving team talks and changing rooms and things to look back on. Uh, anyway, approaching the top of our list, at two, we had Ron Nogara, much to the annoyance of rugby expert Gary O'Hare. Um, Gary, I think you were probably more annoyed that you weren't allowed to pick yourself on your own list. But Wayne, you might talk us through why we have Ron Nogara at number two. Yeah, look, I suppose the reason that we've gone for Ron Nogara here is because of his achievements throughout his career. I mean, he was a fantastic player. I think we all agreed on that. But he's eight on the most capped players list in rugby history. He's a fourth on the all-time scoring list in rugby. He's Munster's all-time leading point scorer as well. Just phenomenal achievements, do you know? Um, I suppose his most famous moment was the 78-minute winner drop goal against Wales in 2009 when we ended our 61-year wait for the Grand Slam. The pressure he must have, must have been under in that scenario. like He displayed great mental strength that day, which is very hard to overlook. I mean, in the build-up to it, he'd missed a tackle on Phillips, which got Wales into a good field position. And Stephen Jones was able to score a drop goal himself with about six minutes to go. And I suppose the pressure was really on that moment. But O'Gara stepped up and I suppose he displayed great confidence and leadership qualities at that moment. And having the ability to orchestrate that team, you know, to get into a scoring position and then have the composure with Stephen Jones charging down his own kick. That was just unreal stuff. And that's why I think we've gone for O'Gara up there as the number two on our list. I think he was perhaps maybe a, a small bit unlucky to miss out on the, the number one spot uh, that he was following such an amazing player as the man that we have at number one because I think he was the one player that none of us could disagree on. He was in all of our lists. Uh, gentlemen, very little argument or debate over this one. Topping our list was Brian O'Driscoll. Uh, I think we're all going to come in on this one, but Gary, I might come to you first. Uh, Brian O'Driscoll, an all-time great, it's fair to say. Yeah, most definitely, Shucks. I think just from when he burst on the scene, that, that hat trick against France just propelled him to the top of the to world rugby. He never won a world rugby player of the year, which is quite remarkable. But like his what he done with Irish rugby, like his ability, like he was two minutes ahead of every other player on the pitch. Like he was only five foot ten. I think people don't realize he wasn't the biggest in the world, but like his. He put his body on the line any every time in that green shirt. He was he was something else. Yeah, I hundred percent agree with Gary. Like, I mean, the two things for me with O'Driscoll would have been his bravery and his creativity. Like some of his offloads during his play, like some of those passes between the legs that we've seen, the little offload to Horg and going down the line, like they're just touches of class. Like, I mean, if Messi or Ronaldo did three or four step overs and beat a player and stuff the ball in the top corner, we'd be talking about it for years to come. Mm-hmm. Like there, his bravery, I suppose, is there was that clip that stands out in my mind when he was down receiving treatment for Leinster against Munster, and the play continued. And as the play was drifting towards where O'Driscoll was receiving treatment, he just got up as if nothing was wrong with him at all and put in a tackle. Like, I mean, that's stuff like it. Yeah, not yeah. everybody has it within him you know, it, no, Driscoll it, certainly had it t- testament, testament to him as well that he's Ireland's leading try scorer and you know that's not even the aspect of the game that most people will probably remember about him Jimmy you were, you were adamant to have Brian O'Driscoll as well in your list you might give us uh, you might shine a bit of light on that for us ah, look listen it's very simple that's right he consistently performed on the world stage time after time he led by example, he had individual br- brilliance, he had the ability to create something out of nothing. O'Driscoll had it all, and by far, he's Ireland's number one rugby player. And on that note, we'll leave it there so, folks. There we have it, our top five Irish rugby internationals of our generation. A list that proved more difficult to choose than we would first have thought, but nonetheless, a nice opener to today's episode. If you enjoyed that, next week, tune in as in similar fashion, we'll be drawing on our top five Gaelic footballers of our generation. Jimmy and Wayne are currently Googling other footballers other than Colin Cooper. <laughs> make for a great debate amongst our panellists. Coming up after the break, in part two, stay with us as we're joined by Irish international hockey star Roisin Upton, where we'll be take, uh, talking through her life journey from her time in college in America 
all the way through to scoring the winning penalty against Canada in the Olympic qualifiers. Stay with us. So welcome back to part two of the extended panel sports show brought to you in association with Lear Media. We're extremely fortunate and lucky to have world silver medalist Irish hockey player Limerick Person of the Year 2019. The list goes on. Roisin Upton joining us in the studio. <laughs> Roisin, uh, your list of achievements is, is staggering and you now have another claim to fame in that you're the first ever guest on the extended panel sports show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not too sure how that ranks in your list, but I imagine it's quite high. Roisin, it's a, it's oh, an yeah. to have you. you're very welcome to the show. Thanks a million. It would definitely be up there. <laughs> how are you finding the, the lockdown and stuff? Strange times for us all, but uh, how, how are you finding it? Yeah, it is strange. I suppose the first couple of weeks, um, we didn't know how long it was going to last, so I tried to stick to a routine as much as we could, um, as much as I could here at home. Um, and in many ways, um, I'm used to training by myself down here, um, and I'm used to training full time, so it didn't change a whole lot um, until the Olympics got postponed. But um, yeah, I'm doing all right. I have, have, have you, my good days. Where Have you been doing a lot of training or are you kind of mixing it up a bit and doing, you know, we'll say stuff that you didn't have time to do with in, in your normal training routine? Or? We just had the past four weeks off, actually. Um, we were just given a communication break. So any training that you did was up to yourself, um, which was quite enjoyable. Yeah, I, I didn't actually do anything too different. I still gymmed and ran. Um, I haven't picked up a hockey stick in, in a couple of weeks. Uh, but we're just back this week now, so the structure is, is a welcome back. I'm joined as well by my colleague, Jimmy Maher from the Extended Panel. Jimmy, you're with us. Shocks, how are things? Great to have Roisin on the show today. Guarantee it to be a highlight of her career, talking to the two of us. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump straight into it, Roisin. So coming from a, a sporting family, you might just give us maybe a bit of an insight into your background in sport growing up. What other sports did you play? Yeah, I um I grew up in Janesboro where soccer was the biggest sport. So I suppose my earliest memories would be playing with my older brother Sean on the boys' soccer team. Um and it would have been like that until I was nine or ten. Um there wasn't any teams for girls. And then in in uh, on Moskull in Limerick, um the model of the primary school, um uh, I played again with the boys with Gaelic football and um basketball. So it was mainly soccer, Gaelic football, basketball. Um, until I got to secondary school and that's when um, hockey became available. Yeah, it was the main sport for girls and I was sports mad growing up. I did I did everything. I played music um, for a while. I played piano, speech and drama, um, spotlight stage school, but sport was the big love. Um, I suppose it came from my dad. He was soccer mad, so having two older brothers uh, as well. You know, I was used to being their tackle bag out in the back garden. Uh, I was going to say, I suppose having sports mad. Brothers. Having the two brothers and I would say the influence from your father gave you that kind of competitive edge. But m moving then into your secondary school, you were Munster and Ireland Youth Player of the Year in 2011. Did uh, did hockey kind of just come naturally to you, or is it something you really had to work work on? You know? No, yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't good at all at the start. To be honest, I was always very athletic and physical. I was strong and sure, oozing in competitiveness. Um, probably from my mum actually. Um, but. I stuck with it and I think, um, you know, I was making great friends. We were training twice a week down the comp after school. Um, and yeah, I, I just fell in love with the challenge of it. Gaelic football and soccer had come a lot easier to me. Um, and from there, yeah, I started to get some Munster trials with the girls um, and then some Irish trials. And yeah, it was brilliant. I had some great experiences underage. Brilliant. And, and Roisin, when, when did the dream of, of going to America um, and the UConn, University of Connecticut, when did that uh, dream, I suppose, become a reality for you, getting a hockey scholarship and, and heading over to the States? Um, I don't know if it was ever a dream. Uh, my mum had her own ideas. But um, when I was in school, um, about, there was a girl called Kate Consmith who was um, an, a legend. So she played on the Irish 18s team, so skillful. We all looked up to her and she went over to the University of New Hampshire. Um, she was about four years above me, I think. So I knew that some people had done it and they loved it. But for me, I was such a homebird. All I wanted to do was go to Mary I, become a primary teacher, you know, try and make the Irish senior team. 
Um, and then one day my mum came in and said, sure, I'm after emailing all these American colleges, you know, let's look into it. And I thought she was mad. I had no more of an interest. Um, but eventually, uh, once we explored it and I actually talked to some of the coaches, I realised, Jeannie, I'd be, I'd be mad not to for a year. And as a young Irish girl he heading over to the States, like, what were the challenges you faced academically and in sport? Like, what, what are the expectations of, that the college put on you? Um, well, for the University of Connecticut itself, um, there's no professional sports in Connecticut, so they don't have an NFL team that they follow or an NBA team, so the whole state gets behind the university, so it's, it's huge. Um, but in many senses, you know, I think it's probably the closest that I'll ever get to being a professional athlete with how you're treated, um, you know, the resources that they have over there, the treatment uh, is second to none um you know we trained six days a week together on campus um i lived on campus everything was a stone's throw away we had academic advisors to help us with our lectures um you know my life has always been so structured but over there everything was to a t you know you went from lectures from nine to twelve then you went and had an hour with the physio um or cooling down and then you went to training for three hours you did some video um and then the evenings you know you did some more college work and and dinner and in the off season then you enjoyed the real american college life but um <laughs> yeah you know it was i absolutely loved it the plan was to go for a year but i stayed for four and a half um wow. and I, I couldn't recommend it enough yeah there's actually so many opportunities um to go over there and uh for the first time actually there's um a girl from the crescent anna horn uh going over to yukon also now in september so it'd be great to follow nice. her journey brilliant fantastic and and, and say we'd say um you won practically every honor over there um you know i'm, I'm sure college <laughs> they love college to hand out trophies <laughs> <laughs> and you love to win them <laughs> no <laughs> but uh is there any standout moment look I, i'm sure you make great friends like college is is such a fantastic experience but the fact you went over to america to do it and um you know i'm sure you you, you know you were extremely proud of what you've done, but is there any standout moment over there? Just said, yeah, really, this for me um, was 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 special. Um, I suppose it would be within sport. You know, it would be within hockey. We hadn't won the national championship, which is the equivalent of the All Ireland um, since 1984, and um, it was you know our head coach had been there for over 30 years. She had never done it um, as a head coach, and we managed to win it in my second year. Um, and it was just unbelievable. Yeah, you know, those girls grew up just like we would grow up, you know, looking at Limerick, wanting to play for Limerick, wanting to play in Crow Park, or just being fans, you know, that is the, the big thing in Ireland. But they grew up dreaming of getting scholarships to go to college to win national championships. So it was when I really understood more about the culture and what it actually meant. And um, yeah, I just felt really at home. So yeah, it was, it was definite highlight. Uh, college over in America is, is is such a fantastic experience, but they love their sport and and sport over there is you know huge. And I can only imagine when you talk about Connecticut not having an NFL or an NBA team, I can only imagine the whole place coming behind the the university. You know, it must have been un unbelievable. Yeah, you know, especially looking at the basketball players, like they're walking around campus and they're absolute celebrities. Um, it's crazy, you know, they'd have like one or two million followers on Instagram, you know, they're going into that. And it was the, the great thing about UConn was that it was the men and the women's team. They were both hugely followed and both hugely successful. Um, when we were in, I think it was my second or third year, um, the men and the women both won uh, the basketball and we won. So like, I can't even explain to you what campus was like for the whole week after the men and women won in March. It was insane. Um, but yeah, they love their sports. They do. It's, it's definitely a religion over there. It must've been, must've been amazing. And you know, you touched a bit there on at this stage, we'll say hockey was really becoming very serious in your life and it was being taken so seriously over there from the training. You know, you might just talk us through moving to your international career right up to that moment when you got that first phone call would say bring you into the squad you know that pathway you know how serious how serious things were getting the training involved the mental aspect of it you might just give us an idea of you know I suppose you knew this was coming down the line right up to that moment when you got that first phone call yeah so it was a strange one I was told um when I go to America that I'd never make an Irish team because it was frowned upon it was looked it was yeah I suppose it was quite looked upon quite negatively that you're stepping backwards um 
which was strange given at the time the Irish women were ranked 15 or 16 and the US women are ranked fifth or sixth. So it was a quite, a quite high standard over there. Um, so I went with that risk, um, making a life decision. Um, and it was a really tricky one uh, with a lot of people in your ear telling you, you know, so it was, well, wasn't until I was under 21s that um, Dave Passmore, one of the coaches here, got in touch about um, trying to try out for the Irish 21s, which wasn't really expected. Um, and on top of that, then the senior coach at the time also stayed in contact. He was much better than the one that had been there ahead of him, you know. So he had Skyped me over in America asking just how everything's getting on, just to keep in touch. Um, so off the back of that, yeah, I, I managed to play with Irish 21s in, in my third year over there. And then um, in my fourth year, I came home um, in the summer and I was hoping to, the girls had just missed out on qualification at that time for Rio. And I was hoping to um, go to the Europeans a week or two after that because, you know, they were so distraught. So he was bringing a younger squad, but I had some issues with my hips um, and unfortunately I had to be, I had to pull out. Um, so that was so disappointing after waiting so long. And, you know, a lot of the girls that I'd grown up playing 16s and 18s with were now racking up 60, 70 caps. Um, so I went back over to Connecticut for my last year. So that must have been my third year for my last year. Yeah. And um, it wasn't until after the season ends that you get a kind of whole evaluation, medical evaluation. And uh, you literally tell them any niggle, cough, cold, flu you have, like, and they examine everything. It's phenomenal. <clears throat> and it turned out that I had a stress fracture in my foot um, and I had to get double hip surgery for cartilage tears. Um, so that was in December. And in the meantime, I had been called into the Irish squad again to go on a warm weather trip in January. Um, so I was so excited and I had to pull out of that. Um, I would have got my first cap over there again. So I was kind of, you know, I was like, oh my God, is this ever going to happen? Um, so then I was, I ended up being out for yeah, nine months. I got my hip surgeries in February, March, and I was in a boot at the same time for five or six months um, with a really niggly stress fracture. Um, and it, yeah, I went back over to America and I got a call in October. I hadn't played for a year. I was horribly out of shape, um, but they had suffered a bad injury to the captain at the time, Megan Fraser. Um, she tore her, her cruciate, unfortunately. Um, and I got lucky. Yeah, I played in a similar position. So they flew me home from America to get my first cap against Scotland. So it was, it was mad. Yeah, I, I hadn't played for a year and I ended up having to play a match for my club to be eligible to play. You, and then I played three international matches. I tell you, I was absolutely wrecked. <laughs> it was <laughs> mad. We. The moment you got that first cap in your debut against Scotland in 2016, you know, I suppose that made it all kind of worthwhile and, and, and the injury is a distant memory. But I, I suppose, you know, all those injuries and all that kind of hardship, you know, I suppose that fuels you as a player uh, in your training. Now, I know we have a lot of, let's say, English and Dutch hockey team, women hockey team listeners to our podcast, so don't, don't give away too much. <laughs> You, you, might, you might let us know a bit about that training routine. You know, I, I assume you're extremely busy and give us just a bit of an insight into your training schedule and an individual and, and a kind of a, a team-based practice. Yeah, I suppose in the lead up to the World Cup, um, it was a little bit different. We didn't have as much financial support. Um, I suppose off the back of the World Cup success, that increased and we were able to train together much more often. Mm -hmm. So... Um, before all this happened, a typical week would look like um, you play a club game on Saturday and then you go to Dublin and you'll train in Dublin every Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Um, you'll return home, rest on Wednesday, and then you might have either a club or a regional training Thursday and a gym session um, on Friday. So it was, it's pretty full on, like it's semi-pro-ish, amateur, semi-pro, whatever you want to call it. Um, but it's it's taken us to the next level um, and our head coach Sean Dancer is an Australian guy and he's absolutely fantastic like his attention to detail is second to none so he's taken us to the next level as well. Well let's say Roshi in, in terms of approach um, you know it comes across to us that it's, it's absolutely professional your attitude your application and, and everything but you know if you if you delve into the if we can delve into your training at the, uh, you know is it, is it technical is it tactical you know are you working on set plays? Yeah, so it would be, um, because we get to spend so much time together, it would be a mix of, of it all. Um, essentially, you know, if for anyone that's watched the World Cup, we are a very defensive team. Um, you know, we didn't score too many goals. Um, we put up <laughs> a bit of a wall and uh, we got a lot of luck. Um, so when Sean came in, he is um, 
uh, obviously from Australia and New Zealand and they have a different style of hockey you know they're much more attacking a lot more flair skill so he wanted to keep what we had but you know introduce a little bit more excitement into our game um, so there's a real emphasis on that um, another thing would be fitness wise um, so a lot of the time our sessions will be really really intense you know we'll get these plans sent out to us the day before and it'll tell you what drill you're doing for every single minute, what team you're on, what color you should be wearing. Um, detail is insane. Like I've never had that kind of detail before. So you might be playing a game, eight v eight, six minutes on, um, two minutes off, but you're not necessarily playing in, in a position. I might be center back, but he wants us getting high intensity meters in, you know, he wants the sprint speed meters up. Um, you know, mind, he wants us to make mistakes under pressure, you know, when you're highly fatigued. Yeah. Um, so the intensity of training for the past year, you know, everyone on the squad will say it, you know, what were we doing before that? We thought we were training intensely and yeah. genie, it's, it's yeah. tough, but he, he breaks every training plan down into four weeks. So it's kind of like a green week, which is an introductory, supposed to be green, they're all red, but it goes green, orange, red, <laughs> um, which is like, you know, building up the intensity and then you're supposed to have an off week-ish, which is blue. Um, but they're all red, I'll tell you. I love how you say it's a poster. <laughs> yeah. And Roshin, if I, can, if I can just ask you in terms of the, um, I, you, you spoke about Sean's detail. Um, in terms of video analysis, I was looking at your stats uh, from the uh, game against Canada. And I know we'll touch on the can Canadian game later on. But just uh, with the Irish press in that game, um, you know, you, you got 32 tur turnovers in the match. Yeah. Um, I think it was um, uh, 13 counter-attacks, but you only got two inside the circle, um, which if, I, if, if, if I'm correct. Dean, you've done your homework. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we've, done a bit of, we've done a bit of work, all right, you know. But, uh, <laughs> but, but just a question I have for you is that, like, we'd say, I, I, read, I read that you do your video analysis. Is it correct in pairs? Yeah, so um, not even just in pairs, but in small groups, we'd we might be given different aspects of the game to look at and then we present back to the entire group. But it is for that reason, like you said, um, you know, obviously we all view things a little bit differently. So it's good to get a discussion yeah. going. Um, you know, we looked at Canada and their counter attack. Like the lead up to the Canada series was strange because you're scouting one team for eight weeks. Like, you know, we were knocking our heads against the wall saying how much more of this are we going to look at? Yeah. Um, so, God, we knew, like, their age, their heights, their everything was strange, but everyone sees things a little bit differently, so it was great to get a discussion going. Um, well, and then, but is there anything, Roshi, that, that you would actually see that you could bring back to GA, having played it yourself with, with you know, Gaelic football in your time or, or even soccer in your time? Is there anything that you, you've seen within a national setup, you know, that, yeah, that could work in a different code? Um, do you know, I probably, I'd love to get into... The Limerick set up and see what it's like before you make suggestions you know because they could be doing things better than we're doing it you know they could be doing things differently um anyway but they I mean they seem to be going pretty well like they're they're on par to go for an all, another All-Ireland this year you oh, know they're up there <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and I, I suppose Roisin would say you know you within the Irish setup you're you're, you're inside that bubble there um but for your own game for your own individual practice. Um, what are you doing to improve yourself? Um, I suppose you're just trying to um, be present when you're training. You know, it can turn into a bit of a slog when you're training as many hours as we are and when your body's exhausted at the end of a four week block, mm. you know, you don't want it to turn into a stage where you're like, just get through this. Like you still want to get something out of it. So you're trying to, um, yeah, I suppose just be present and be aware and still challenge yourself. Um, for me, I for sure corners, I'm the drag flicker on the team. Um, so it's quite a specialist skill, I suppose, uh, like a free taker in hurling football or, you know, like a flicker in rugby. Um, it takes a couple of hours outside of training individually yourself um, every you, week. You've Tom Cummins with you as well doing the SNC. You have Gary Longwell available uh, within the Irish setup for sports psychology. Um, those guys are, are bring a wealth of experience too and are a great help. Yeah, so actually it's been fantastic. Um, we got on board, myself and Naomi Carl, a uh, Claire lady. Um, she plays in Catholic Institute as well. So we're so lucky. This is the first time ever we got an SNC in Limerick. So we meet with Tom once a week and 
so his expertise, his knowledge, um, you know, he's done it. He's been to the Olympics. So even hearing his stories um, is phenomenal. And uh, I can really even see uh, a change myself in my SNC program and my strength over the past eight months. So that's been brilliant. And um, yeah, I think everybody's heard of the famous Gary Longwell. You know, I think for us, he really changed the whole team atmosphere after the World Cup or before the World Cup and was, um, you know, an unsung hero in our success. And uh, yeah, he's a, he's a great friend of mine. Unfortunately, he's had to pull away from our squad, so he isn't um, directly working with us. But yeah, I talk to him occasionally and and keep in touch. Um, and yeah, it's great to just shoot ideas and you know get things off your mind, stress or anything. And he, he's the person I'd go to. You mentioned the World Cup there, Roshi. And I'm just going to switch it over to that for a second, obviously, because, you know, an amazing, an amazing memory for Irish sport as a whole and for you in particular. Was, was confidence high heading into that World Cup? Obviously, you've all this, this training done, you know, at what stage did you feel everything kind of coming together and, you know, the expectations really get going for that competition in London? No, to be honest, we actually had a terrible preparation. Um, we were losing games left, right and centre. We were getting frustrated at each other. The mood in the camp was awful. Um, there was just, it was a really high pressured environment um, and it wasn't great. Uh, yeah, I suppose we had qualified for the World Cup the summer before and back then um, I'd say the amount of days we met between September and May was, you know, every Sunday here and there. So we probably had 20 days together, you know, it wasn't a great preparation like we've had for the Olympics. Um, and then in the six weeks leading up to the World Cup, that's when it was going to become really intense. So. Yeah, it was it was a strange one, and it wasn't until Gary stepped in and kind of addressed it. Um, and one of the main things was, I suppose, our expectations and also our communication. And and out of that out of that comes this fairy tale story where you, you make that World Cup <laughs> final in London. You know, even if preparation wasn't ideal, how how have things changed since? Um, how have things kind of have they improved? Has recognition gone up? Yeah, in many aspects, you know, I think uh, the sport has boomed in the country. There's been um, a surge of clubs starting, like there's been five in Munster alone. Um, you know, the amount of kids and um, clubs or kids starting and even, I suppose, adults going back and playing hockey that might have played in school. Um, so there's been a real keen interest in it. And then from our own point of view as a team, um, the private sponsorship and the support that we've got from Sport Ireland has increased and has allowed us to train together more often. Um, we now have a national pitch up in Abbottstown, something we didn't have before. You know, we were renting off UCD or off club teams trying to train. Um, so it has definitely improved, yeah. It's a long way to go, but it's improved. The final didn't go your way, but you leave London with a silver medal. A fantastic achievement if, as you know, you're saying there, things weren't ideal kind of in the, in the prep for it. Yeah, we were ranked 15 out of 16. So essentially we went over with the attitude that like we haven't been at a World Cup since 2002. Like there's no expectations. So I don't know why everybody's so stressed about it. So um, that was a huge factor, you know, and it took a lot of pressure off everyone. Let's just enjoy these two weeks and what happens, happens. So I'm just going to bring it then. Uh, my last question of it is, so we head to a sold out energy park in Dublin. You might have thought this one was coming. The Olympic playoff <laughs> versus Canada. You know, a roller coaster of emotions that night. You step up for that sudden death penalty. You know, bring us back to that historic night in Dublin. Yeah, it was, um, Jeannie, it was memorable anyway. We played absolutely rubbish. I <laughs> um, think there was a lot of tension and we didn't play to our, to our potential, um, which is disappointing when we look back. But I think that can happen sometimes, you know, in those one-off or two series games where both teams don't want to lose. Um, We'd never played in front of a crowd like that. Um, you know, the weather did come into it. It was absolutely pouring. I remember after the first game, or during the first game at halftime, I came off and took off my shoes and just like pouring puddles of water out of them um, in the dressing room. It was, it was mad. I don't know how people stayed. I'd been straight at home, <laughs> get warm watching on TV. Um, but the support was phenomenal. Uh, you know, I think, um, I suppose a lot of people don't realise that uh, it was quite a risk. Um, you know, doing that. We didn't re know, or the organisation didn't know how many people would actually show up. So there was a financial risk. And for us, a big part of home advantage is being able to train on a pitch because hockey pitches can vary a lot. Um, and then that got taken away when they decided to have it in Donnybrook because the pitch was only going to be laid three days beforehand. So essentially both teams, you know, got the same amount of time on the pitch. And I know it's only one aspect of home advantage, but there was still a little bit of stress in the squad about it. Um, 
but the pressure was definitely mounting um you know we wanted to go somewhere we hadn't been before there was a lot of stress on maybe the older girls who um had been through one if not two olympic cycles and hadn't qualified um but overall yeah it was, it was a phenomenal weekend Jeannie, you actually you couldn't have scripted the drama and the tension you take that pressure and 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 all that pressure falls on you roisin you know with that final penalty you know what's going through your head as you're stepping up to take that that sudden day penalty um just trying to stay as calm as I can, I suppose. Um, I like being in those situations where you can control uh, the outcome. You know, I think it's actually so much harder to stand by and watch someone else do it. Um, so uh, we practice a lot on visualization and I wouldn't necessarily visualize what I'm going to do, but I'd visualize standing on the white line just before the umpire is about to blow a whistle and that just feeling of being relaxed and back in yourself. Okay. Um, so you try to block it all out, but she saw at the end when we won, Jeannie, the sense of relief, I just collapsed to the ground, it was... Yeah. At, at what stage, Roisin, do, do you actually suddenly realise that, you know, the ball hits the net, the emotion, but suddenly I'm going to Tokyo, suddenly I'm going to the Olympics, suddenly I'm chasing a dream that's finally there, like, phenomenal. Yeah, it was... It was mad, I suppose. Um, I don't know if we realised straight away if it was like a relief that we've come through this big two series games, but then to actually realise what it means. Um, I think it took, you know, a little bit of time off, a week or two off when we were at home and we were all messaging each other, being like, oh God, the preparations are actually going to start in January now because essentially, you know, your January looks very different if you haven't qualified. Like your schedule is very quiet. Teams don't want to play you. You're not going to the Olympics. Um, whereas now we had so much to look forward to. Um, so yeah, it was hugely exciting. Even I suppose on the night when we were doing a lap at the very end, um, and you know you just saw family and friends everywhere. You know every two steps, uh, you saw family and friends, which is obviously something we've never experienced before. It would always be you know the brothers, um, my parents, um, you know your your partners. They're the only ones there. But to have extended family and to have small kids and the excitement on everyone's faces, it was. Yeah, it was a risk worth taking having Donnybrook anyway. I know, fantastic, fantastic. And, and you just spoke about January there. And, um, you know, we'd say when Olympic preparation was meant to start, you go from structured to uncertainty. And with the whole uh, situation, I'd say the whole world faces right now, you, were, you had planned to go to South Africa on tour at the end of March. Obviously, that never went ahead. And the preparation has completely changed now for your Olympic cycle. What, where are you in terms of that now, or what is the, the situation for yourselves? Um, I suppose, like everyone, we're waiting to see to an extent. We have a provisional schedule in place. Um, we got it at the around the same time that all of this started, looking to come back regionally in July. Obviously, that's not going to be possible now. So then it looked at potentially August. That's probably unlikely as well. Um, so it's been adapted all the time. Um, I I suppose um, it'll go back to being as similar as it can be when it can. Um, at the moment, all our training is done regionally. Uh, hopefully in September, we might be able to travel back up to Dublin and get back training with the girls. Um, you know, I think that's probably what I've missed the most, uh, playing in a team. You know, there's only so much training by yourself you can do. I don't know how individual athletes do it. Madness. You end up getting so close because you spend so much time with each other. So you see each other at your best when you're fresh coming in after qualifying and you're very excited and then you see each other at your worst when you're exhausted after a four-week camp you know mm. we're used to being incredibly honest with each other um you know we give each other feedback we're able to take it on the chin so all those things build camaraderie they build relationships um and yeah you know it, it's hugely exciting yeah just on that uh Roisin, obviously you had a plan beyond tokyo 2020 but for yourself personally how do you step away? We see in the green jersey, you're a teacher by profession, but how do you step away from life of hockey and we'll say inside that bubble of the Irish camp? Yeah, we have been in the bubble since the World Cup. Um, and uh, I suppose, you know, I'd be lying if I said my life wasn't revolved around hockey to an extent. Our, our schedule is so busy. Um, but I still live at home in Limerick. I didn't make the move up to Dublin to where all our training is. And uh, I love coming back home and you know meeting my friends playing at my club team um resting and all the rest of it so the original plan would have been to go teaching in september after the olympics and uh, we had originally scheduled a break until christmas 
Um, so that'll just be put on hold for another year. Is, is it very difficult to balance then the two? We'll say teaching, you know, you're teaching by profession and then your, your life as a hockey player as well. It's, it's, it's a fairly full on commitment. It is at the stage of um, my career in teaching. So I only graduated last May, so I wasn't able to teach for the past year because um, you need to be there five days a week to get your diploma done. Whereas one of the girls on the team, Hannah Matthews, is also a primary teacher and um, she's been teaching for a couple of years. She's, uh, she was able to get a contract teaching only two days or three days a week, every second week, you know, right. um, because she has her diploma done. So it just, it just depends, yeah. Depends a bit. Well, just for a bit of uh, fun, we'll say, to finish the interview, what we're going to do is kind of rapid fire questions. So I'm going to put you on the timer here, put you on the spot. Uh, and we're just going to fire 10 kind of quick, quick questions at you. Three seconds. So three, two, one. Okay. So Netflix or Disney Plus? Netflix. Instagram or Twitter? Oh, Instagram. Hurling or football? <laughs> oh, genie. Football. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Messi or Ronaldo? Ronaldo. Oh, no. Olympics or World Cup? Olympics. Sexton or O'Gara? Oh, Gara. <laughs> Biggest mess around your Irish rugby squad or your Irish happy squad, sorry. <laughs> Biggest mess, oh God, there's a few. Um, Lena Tice would be up there, one of the youngest on the squad. Uh, the last book you read? Um, I'm reading one about Starbucks at the moment. I can't think of what it's called. All about Starbucks and how that's set up. Okay. Uh, the best stadium you've played in? London. London. And your favourite podcast? This one. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it was a lot. It was a lot thinking on that last question. Last I question. know. Oh God, my heart is in my chest. <laughs> uh, Roshi, what a fantastic interview. I, I hope you enjoyed it. We certainly did. Uh, remarkable insights into what it takes to play, obviously, such a high level, and of course, the life outside of sport too. So thanks a million for coming on. A huge honour to have you, uh, especially being a Limerick-based sports star. So thanks, Roshi. Thanks a million, guys. And that just about brings us to an end, this second part of the show to a conclusion. To all the listeners, I hope you enjoyed the interview. Stay with us for part three, coming right up as the panellists address questions from the viewers. Fanny Gillian. <laughs> Welcome back to the studio. Uh, big thanks once again to Roisin. Uh, I'm sure like us here in the studio, ye the listeners enjoyed hearing her story. An incredible person and athlete. Jim, I think I'll come to you first there. You listened back on Roisin's interview. Uh, a really special talent and a special person as well. Um, I suppose a couple of things really stand out for me is, is um, she never forget, she's never forgotten where she's from. Um, there's immense pride. When she talks, there's immense pride about being from Limerick, about playing for a Catholic institution about going to school in the present comprehensive, about playing for Ireland, immense pride, you know, and she always refers to her parents, her family, her friends and her coaches. Like right now, you know, she and her hockey team have inspired the next generation of women hockey, women's hockey in Ireland. And look, we wish them huge success, the very best look in the Olympics and um, hopefully really, really hoping that they, they can bring home a medal from there. Like you said there, you know, of all the achievement or uh, of everything she's achieved, and, uh, you know, all the success she's had in the sport still remains really, really humble. And I know that was something you admired as well, Wayne. I'll come to you next. You were listening back on, uh, on myself and Jimmy's interview with Roisin. And we spoke last week on, we'll say, the impact that injuries can have on a person's career in all different kind of sports. Today we learned of Roisin's struggles with hip injury and uh, a fracture in her foot. Um, a remarkable story of how she battled through that, kept the faith, and eventually ended up in the Irish setup. Yeah, an exceptional achievement, Shucks, to overcome such serious injuries for Roisin. There must have been such a high level of determination, commitment and drive within her. Like, to battle on and overcome a stress fracture in her foot and two hip surgeries, like, absolutely phenomenal. Suffering injuries like that, like, they're common for all sports stars, regardless of what code you play, be it hockey, GA, rugby, etc. And it can be a very difficult thing to overcome. The trauma the body goes through physically, the mental challenges players must face in order to return can be very difficult sometimes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going from the highs and enjoyment through performance to being left on the bench or maybe on the couch, extremely difficult. 
and having to take all that rehabilitation information from the professionals is not a quick process and it takes serious time, dedication and effort to perform simple exercises which probably get taken for granted normally. But they can have such an impact in speeding up in the recovery and the ability to return the performance. So of course, like sometimes careers can also be ended within sport. It's the very harsh reality for people to take, but unfortunately that is the reality within sports. Luckily for us and the Irish hockey setup, Roisin was able to recover and to play such a pivotal role in the success of this team so far. And who knows where they can go. And I mean, it showed incredible maturity for a girl of her age as well in college in a different country to show that resilience and to keep the faith that, that things would come her way. So just to say again, once, once again, a huge thank you for uh, to Roisin for joining us, especially as a Limerick-based radio show. In, uh, it was particularly nice to get a Limerick sports star for our first interview. We have many more sports uh, stars lined up in the coming weeks, so stay tuned. Give our Instagram and Twitter maybe a, a cheeky follow to find out who will be appearing on the following show. Gentlemen, we have, I won't call it fan mail, but our viewers and our listeners have gotten contact with the page uh, with questions for the panel. So to finish <laughs> off today's show, this will be good. I, I'm just going to read out a couple of the messages we got sent via email and Instagram. The first person who got in contact with the page, now in the interest of confidentiality, I won't give his name. The listener got in contact and asked, Hi lads, my question is, if you could choose any one player from the ranks of the GAA who you think could make it in a professional sport, who would you pick and in what sport? A brilliant question. Um, Gary, do you want to jump in on that one for us to start? Yeah, very good question. Shocked I'm going to go with Lee Keegan. On the wing in rugby union. Yeah, great choice. He's a serious, serious athlete. I think if, it, if I was putting up a box kick there, I think that man would be a great man to chase it down. Mm, playing, playing as a halfback himself, uh, a wing back in football. I mean, he has that experience along, along that touchline. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy, maybe you want to come in next. Who have you gone for? Um, it's a very good question, Shucks. Um, let me think. I suppose, right, I'll I give you one for football and I'll give you one for hurling. Um, so in terms of hurling, um, because we're a Limerick show, I'm going to go with Keen Lynch. I think Keen Lynch could make it in soccer. I think he has great balance, great skill. Like skilly shows in the hurling field, you know, unbelievable. And, and I think he'd, his balance, his skill, his speed, his strength, just composure, um, I, I think... He'd, but at uh, times he's make, doing he's doing soccer skills with a hurley stick out there, you know, nutmegs and everything. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So I'd be going Keen Lynch, and I'll say football. I tell you, the double of footballers. Look, we all know what they've done, and um, I would probably, you know, the likes of James McCarthy or Brian Fent for Dublin, um, transfer across into the rugby. Like those two guys cover some amount of ground. They're savage athletes. Mm. Their power. You know, the modern game of rugby, they would be serious, I think. Yeah, definitely. I think I'm going to move it on now just to keep things moving, just to Wayne. Wayne, who have you gone for? Well, I've had a little bit of time there now to think about it, Shucks, right? So, again, I, I've gone a bit like Jimmy. I've had a football one and a hurling one, OK? Yeah. So the football one, anyway, I've gone with is Philly McMahon. And I think he'd do well in the MMA. <laughs> like he's such a strong, physical and imposing defender, right? I just feel that he'd be able to hold his own in the octagon. That's and if I could get one match lined up with him now, I'd love to see himself and McGregor have a go at it. <laughs> now, the hurler that I've gone with is Henry Shefflin. And I know that's going to delight Jimmy up there on the top now, but <laughs> I've gone with Henry anyway, right? And I suppose I was struggling there for a minute on what sport. Would I put him with cricket or would I put him with baseball? But I think I'm actually going to put him playing golf, right? And I just think, look, Henry over his career, like he was such a reliable man over a free. He's unbelievable accuracy. And like he always made the right decision on the, on the pitch. I mean, he could probably give Tiger Woods, who we spoke about last week, a run for his money. Choosing the right club, the right approach, the correct distance, power in a, in a putt. Henry Shefflin, golf, that's for me. Well, is it is it too much to ask maybe to uh, to dream of Henry Shefflin coming down Augusta next year maybe when all this lockdown is finished? I, I'd say get the clubs out if you're listening, Henry, because you, we could have you on as a guest if, if you somehow managed to make a guest appearance. 
Um, I suppose I've had the I've had the, the look here because I've been able to see these questions in advance, so I've given them a lot of thought. Uh, I've two options like yourselves, but both of both of them being footballer uh, footballers. Uh, first as a Kerry man, Joe Bradley will love this one. I've gone for Sean Kevin of Tyrone. Uh, I think it's obvious he'd make a great rugby player, widely credited for the introduction of the black card, uh, for that infamous tackle against Manham. I mean, flawless technique, amazing strength. I think he'd slot in perfectly at a, a number eight for Ulster and maybe Ireland. And my other option then, a Galway man who I think could challenge any man in the ring would be Damien Comer. I mean, the sheer size, strength, power, aggression, uh, even that kind of intimidation factor that Comer brings, you know, I think he'd be an animal in the ring. And just, just picturing it now, you know, that domineering shadow of Comer, maybe in a, a full Madison Square Garden in the dark, uh, perhaps the Galway shawl being played in a distant background. I mean, you know, goosebumps, lads. We can only picture it. Brilliant. Very good, Chuck. <laughs> no, so <laughs> another question from the panel. I think it's an, another question uh, sent in from a listener. This listener said... If the Ryder Cup Golf and the Darts World Championship were on the television at the same time and you could only watch one, which would you choose and why would it be to turn off the television? Now, I think it's a, this person obviously isn't a golfer or a darts fan. I just finds them a bit boring, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll argue it nonetheless and we'll have a discussion on it. Gary, which would be your preferred option of the two? I'd say, Shucks, I prefer to watch the golf. I prefer to watch the golf on TV. Uh, I'd imagine I would much prefer to be at a darts event, though. If it was a live event, it would be darts all day long. <laughs> and what uh, Gary was saying there, Wayne, you know, about the party atmosphere maybe in the, in the Alley Pally, would you prefer that or, and, and would you opt for the darts or would you prefer to be out in the open watching the, the Ryder Cup with the, with the huge crowds in, in the distant future? Uh, I, I could agree with Gary, definitely. Look, they do seem to be enjoying themselves at the darts, and I'm, I'm sure I could find a seat where I'd settle in nicely at that event. But I think if I was going to choose between the two of them, um, it would have to be probably the Ryder Cup for me. Like, I just think that that's a phenomenal tournament. Like, I mean, you get to see the best golfing athletes in Europe against America every few years, like in phenomenal golf courses, and you see some of the greatest golf shots uh, under immense pressure. Like It'll probably be the Ryder Cup for me, Shucks. Yeah, it really brings out the best in a lot of players. I think they start playing, you know, even out of their own abilities at times. Jimmy, uh, are you in agreement with, with Gary or Wayne? You have the last the last call on this one. Uh, I'd be the Ryder Cup, Shucks, to be honest, so I'd have to go Wayne on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. That's a, that's a lie. <laughs> 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 Just that brings us uh, to our final question of the evening. This is my own personal favourite. So this listener said, hello, a big fan of the page, really enjoyed the first episode. What I want to know is with over 1,100 views on the first YouTube video and over 200 followers on the Instagram page, has the stardom gone to the panel's heads? Uh, can Wayne Power still remember the price of a carton of milk? <laughs> 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 well, well I can tell you now Shucks since yeah. last weekend all I've been putting on my car plates in the morning has been champagne <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about the rest of the lads <laughs> well, I see I see, Paul, but, I see I see Jimmy nodding and shaking his head above on the top you enjoyed that one Jimmy I sure I did, Chucks. Look, I tell you, since last weekend, what I'm thinking of is, is, is power of what he said about his uh, last dance documentary. Like, Waterford, that's some great achievements throughout the years. Minor in 2013, 21 in 2016. You know, Munster finals, winning four of them. And what does power make a documentary on? The row against Clare, 98. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, <really>? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's that kind of statement that maybe brings in the listeners and brings in the viewers, you might say. Uh, so on that note, I think that brings our second episode to a conclusion. Join us next week for another sport-filled show. Please feel free to get in contact with the page using our Instagram or Twitter handles at Extended Panel. Let us know who your top five Irish rugby players are and share any questions you'd like us to address in the coming show. Thanks again to the wonderful Roisin, Up, uh, Roisin Upton for coming online with us today. And if you've made us this far, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. From all of us here at the Extended Panel, please stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you all next Sunday at 6pm with a brand new episode.